Okay, so lecture three. So we start by reviewing a mapping or a function from one set to another. If it's from the set X to the set Y, the set X is called the domain and the set Y is called the range. And if you take a point in X, it gets mapped to some point F of X, which the author of this book writes simply as FX. And we're used to writing F of X and the X in parentheses. That's the way we do it in calculus. Both are okay. That's a function, sends a point in X to a point in Y. And it's one-to-one -one if different points in X get sent to different points in Y. So that's a one-to-one -one function. And we also have the notion of an onto function from X to Y. So F is onto if for each element Y in the set capital Y, there exists an X in X such that X gets mapped to Y. F of X is equal to Y. So if I start with a point Y in the set capital Y, there's always a point X in the set capital X, such that F of X is equal to Y. That's what it means for a function to be onto. And a function that has both of these properties, a function that is one to one and onto is called a one-to-one -one correspondence. So this is all just vocabulary. This is learning the words we use when we talk about mathematics. The most important set in the universe is capital N, which is the set of positive integers. So these are called the natural numbers or the positive integers. The N, I guess, comes from the word natural. Um, and we need a formal definition of what it means for a set to be finite. So a set S is finite if it has n elements for some n. And what that means is if there is a one-to-one -one correspondence from S to the set of the first n positive integers. And we say the size of the set is n. So that's just a formal definition of a finite set. Um, the empty set has size zero. A non-empty set is infinite if it's not empty and not finite. That there's no way to put it in a one-to-one -one correspondence with the positive integers. And there's some simple properties of the sizes of sets that it's important to know. So, We'll write, the book writes it a slightly different way. It's like twisted, but this S is equal to the size of S. So for example, if S is the set two, three, and 17, the size of S is three. If N is the positive integers, the size of N is infinite.
If you have two sets, S and T, and S and T are disjoint. What disjoint means, they have no elements in common. S intersect T is the empty set. Then the size of S union T is the size of S plus the size of T. And how will we actually show that? So, so I, how do we give a proof of a statement like this? You might say it's sort of obvious, but how do you give a proof? So suppose the size of S is N. So that means you have a function F from S to the first N integers, which is a one-to-one -one correspondence. So that means some element of S gets, so define S sub I by S sub I, F of S sub I is equal to I for I going from one up to N. That is every element from one to N is the image of some unique elements in S because this is a one-to-one -one correspondence. So S becomes S1, S2. You can enumerate the elements from one up to N. And if the size of T is M, that means there's a function G from T to the set of the first M integers. And T can be enumerated, T1, T2, up to T sub M. So I claim there's a function H from S union T to the set of integers from one up to M plus N. And what's the way to define it? So you could define S, F of S of I to be equal to I for I going from one up to N, sorry, H. And H of T sub I is N plus I. Well, let me use the letter J, the subscript J, N plus J for J from one up to M. So if you think about it, this is a one-to-one -one and onto mapping, a one-to-one -one correspondence from S union T to M plus N. Maybe just to make this a tad more concrete, I'll draw a picture of an example. Let's suppose Mr. that S- Question one second, can you flip so I can take a picture of the notes because I wasn't able to write it. Sure. Thank you. I, I got it, thank you. So for example, suppose the size of S is four. So S maybe consists of the elements S1, S2, S3, S4. And the size of T is three. So maybe T consists of the elements T1, 2, T2, T3. So S union to end, S intersect T is empty. None of these elements is equal to any of these elements. So if I take the union of the sets, that's everything in here and everything in here. And I can define a function H from S union T to the set of the first seven integers as follows, H of S one is one, H of S two is two, H of S three is three, H of S four is four, H of T one is five, H of T two is six, and h of t3 is 7. So h is a function from s union t to the first seven integers. And it's defined explicitly like this. Hmm. 
Okay. Any questions about that? Okay. Um, so this is something about the size of the union of two sets when the sets are disjoint. Let's suppose the sets are not disjoint. So suppose we have finite sets S and T and S intersect T isn't the empty set. What can we then say about the cardinality of S union T? So the theorem says the following, the cardinality of S union T if they're disjoint, it's just the cardinality of S plus the cardinality of T. Cardinality means size. It's just, this is all standard language in mathematics. But if the sets are not disjoint, this is not true. You have to subtract the number of things in the intersection. So this is the formula for the size of the union of two sets in general. If the intersection is empty, this is zero, and that's just the formula we proved a moment ago. An equivalent way of writing this is that the number of elements in S union T plus the number of elements in S intersect T is equal to the number of elements in S plus the number of elements in T. Right, so I just took this to the other side of the equation. I moved this from right to left. This is actually an exercise 15 beta in the textbook. So how can we prove this proof? Suppose we let R be equal to S intersect T. So this is everything which belongs to both S and T. So if this is S and this is T, this in this Venn diagram, this is R. So let's suppose the cardinality of S is N, cardinality of T is M, and let's say that the cardinality of this intersection R is equal to L. So R, I can write the elements as R1, R2, up to R sub L. Now, this has L elements. S altogether has N elements. So the number of elements in S that aren't in L is going to be N minus L. In other words, if I take S and remove R, I have a set with N minus L elements. I can write them as S1, S2, up to S sub N minus L. And in fact, then S is S1 up to S N minus L plus the elements in R, R1 up to R sub L. So this is R and I write S minus R like this, this is what S is. And similarly, T has M elements, L of them are in the intersection. The elements which are not in the intersection there are M minus L of them. So T with R removed consists of elements T1, T2 up to T sub M minus L. And so T is what? It's these elements plus these. T1 up to T sub M minus L, R1 up to R sub L.
Right. Any questions about this? This is just beginning to learn how to think about sets. This is all sort of prerequisite to doing some algebra. So, so let's just recall, size of S is N, size of T is N, size of R, which is the intersection, is L and we want to show, must prove the size of S union T is the size of S plus the size of T minus the size of the intersection, which is N plus M minus L. We want to prove this formula. And remember, S consists of the elements S1 up to S of N minus L, R1 up to RL. T consists of the elements T1 up to T sub M minus L, R1 up to R sub L. So what is in S union T? You have all the elements in S, all the elements of T, which includes those, all of these and all of these. So I have S1 up to S of N minus L, T1 up to T sub M minus L, and R1 up to RL. And these elements are distinct. So I can define a function, I'll call it H, from S union T to the set of all the integers up to n plus m minus l as follows. H of s i is equal to i for one up to n minus l. H of t j is going to be equal to n minus l plus j. This brings me all the numbers up to n minus L. So this goes, for, so this is for J from one up to m minus L. So on the number line, these numbers go from one to n minus L. These numbers go from n minus L plus one up to n minus L plus m minus L, and then H of R sub well, K is going to be equal to n plus m minus two L, that's what this is, plus K for K from one to L. So that brings me up to, this is from n plus m minus 2l plus 1 up to n plus m minus l. And if you write down some concrete example, I mean, this is pretty concrete, but if you pick little numbers, you know, m, n, and l, you know, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, you can actually sort of see it um, in your fingers. Okay. Someone asked about the quality of the videos on YouTube. So I don't know anything that I can do about that. I'm not, um, 
I mean, it may be possible for someone to change the resolution in some sense, but uh, I don't think it's possible with the equipment that I have. Um, so, no, uh, I don't know. What about what is called the product? Also called the Cartesian product of sets S and T. So you have a set S and a set T. The product is the set of all ordered pairs, S comma T, where S is in S and T is in T. And it's called the Cartesian product because you know the most important case of this, which is the plane, R2, which is R cross R, R times R, right? You know, you learn in pre-calculus, you can take a point in the plane, it has an X coordinate and a Y coordinate. The point in the plane is this ordered pair of two real numbers. So this is the Cartesian plane. or the X, Y plane. They're all the just same name, different names for the same object. So you know this very well from calculus and pre-calculus, high school algebra. You can write a point in the plane as a, in terms of coordinates X and Y. This is the, the plane is all ordered pairs X, Y, where X and Y come from the same set R. And in general, S times, S times T, or any sets S and T is the set of all ordered pairs. So for example, if S is the set A, B, C, and T is the set one, two, S cross T, it's all ordered pairs where the first coordinate comes from S and the second coordinate comes from T. So you could have A1 or A2 or B1 or B2 or C1 or C2. Right. That's the product of these two sets. And you notice in this example, there's six elements in here. Cardinality of S cross T in this example is six, which you will notice is three times two. And the set S has exactly three elements and the set T has exactly two elements. So in this example, the size of the Cartesian product of two sets is the product of the sizes of the sets. Okay. And this is a special case of the following general fact that for any two finite sets, S and T, the size of the product S times T is the product of the size of S times the product times the size of T. This is also an exercise in the book at 15 gamma. So you might think a little bit, how can you prove such a thing? Number of elements in S times T. Oh, excuse me one second. Let me just pause this. Yeah. So how can we prove this? That's kind of an interesting question. So suppose S again has N elements and T 
has m elements so we want to show prove that the product has n times m elements so you could think of it maybe like this you start with you have like s1 comma tj so you have all the pairs where the first coordinate s1 and the second is one of these tj's j from one up to m and then you have s2 times tj again j goes from one up to m all the way to sn times tj j goes from one up to m each of these sets has exactly m elements. So one way to prove this is the following. Suppose we define the set R sub i to be the set of all ordered pairs S i T j, where the i is fixed, but the j is from one to m. So the size of R i is exactly m. This is all the pairs where the second coordinate is one of the t's, but the first coordinate doesn't change. And then we can say the following. If i1 is different from i2, then ri1 and ri2, these sets are empty because Everything in here has one first coordinate, and everything in here is a different first coordinate. So the product can be written as the union of these sets R sub i. i goes from 1 up to n. And the sets R sub i are pairwise disjoint. So the number of elements in S times t, the product, we prove that if two sets are disjoint, the union has a size, which is the sum of the sizes. But if we have, we can generalize that. If you have n sets that are pairwise disjoint, the same thing is true. So this is the sum. I goes from one up to n, the size of R sub i. But each R sub i has size m. So this is the sum from one up to n, m. That is, I'm just adding m to itself n times. That's the definition of multiplication. That's mn, which is the size of s times the size of t. So that is a simple example of a proof in set theory. Questions about this? One more very important structure that comes from sets is something called an equivalence relation. So let me just say, um, there's an abstract notion of a relation between sets. And it is the following. Let's try to use the same notation as the text. So a relation is simply a subset, a relation between sets X and Y. is just a subset of the Cartesian product x times y. So just R is a relation if it's a subset of the Cartesian product. 
X and Y can be the same set or they can be different sets. A relation on X is a subset of the Cartesian product of X with itself. So here's a simple example. Um, suppose X is the set one, two, three. So the Cartesian product of X with itself, that consists of ordered pairs, there are nine of them. One, 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 two, one, three, two, one, two, 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 three, three, one, three, two, three, three. So what's an example of a I'm relation? Sorry, yeah. Would you say that um, the Cartesian product is basically the amount of ways you can multiply the set by itself? Um, or is it too um, broad to actually like? Well, say? you're not multiplying in the sense of like seven times four is 28. The Cartesian product is all possible pairs where the first coordinate comes from the, the set on the left and the second coordinate comes from the set on the right. So this is an okay. example. Okay, I understand. Okay. So suppose you let R be the following three ordered pairs, one, one, two, two, three, three. So this is a relation on X or on X times X. This is this is all of the ordered pairs. This is a subset. And we call R equality. Right? This is the relation of equality uh, on a pair where the first coordinate equals the second coordinate. But this is an example of a relation. It's this um, somewhat abstract concept. It's just subset of the ordered pairs. And it's easy to say, but it takes a lot of time to think about it to sort of understand. But in algebra, the most important kind of relation, maybe the only relation we're going to consider is called an equivalence relation. And an equivalence relation on a set X is a, it's a relation. So it's a subset R of the Cartesian product of X with itself that satisfies the following three properties. First, the ordered pair X comma X is in the relation for all X in the set X, right? That is all pairs where the first coordinate equals the second coordinate. Right? This property is sometimes called reflexive. And the second property is that if the pair X comma Y is in R, then the pair Y comma X is also in R. So there's a certain symmetry. If one, if X, Y is in R, so is Y, X. And in fact, this is called, this property is called symmetric property. This is symmetric. And the third property says that if X comma Y is in R and Y comma Z is in R, then X comma Z is in R. So if X is related to Y and Y is related to Z, then X is related to Z. And this property is called transitive.
So just as a simple example, suppose we let the set X be the integers, positive, negative, and zero. And suppose we let R be the set of all ordered pairs X comma Y, such that X minus Y is an even integer divisible by two. So this is a subset of the Cartesian product with n with itself. So for example, three nine is in R because three minus nine is minus six is even. Three ten is not in R because three minus 10 is minus seven is not even, it's odd, right? So I can take a relation on the integers to be all pairs X, Y of integers where X minus Y is even. Okay, any questions about this example I'm setting up? So, I claim this relation R is an equivalence relation. So I need to prove that this relation has the properties of being reflective, symmetric, and transitive. So for all integers x, x minus x is zero, zero is even, it's two times zero is even. So the pair x comma x is in R for all integers x, right? So this relation is reflexive. Why is it symmetric? If the pair x, y is in R, then x minus y is even which means X minus Y is 2K for some integer K, which means Y minus X multiplied by minus one is minus 2K or two times minus K is also even. So the pair Y X is an R. So if X Y is an R, Y X is an R. So this relation is symmetric. Why is it transitive? If X, Y is in R and Y, Z is in R, then X minus Y is some even integer. And Y minus Z is some even integer. Suppose I add these equations. On the left, the y's cancel, I get x minus z is 2k plus 2l. This is two times k plus l, that's even. So x minus z is even, so xz is in the relation. So this relation is also transitive. So this is a very important example of an equivalence relation.
just as an exercise, spend a minute or two to think about the following. Define a relation R on the integers by x, y is in R if x minus y is divisible by three. Prove that R is an equivalence relation. on Z. So right now, just you know, take a piece of paper and spend a couple of minutes proving this. Well, the proof is very similar to what we just did, so I don't want to repeat it now, but it's a very good uh, exercise to think about. Another bit of notation. If we have an equivalence relation R, uh, we write x, these three lines equivalent to or congruent to y are, if this is just another way of saying that the, that x and y, the pair x, y is an r. So this is just notation, it means the same thing. But what's very important is the idea of the equivalence class. So we have this equivalence relation r, on the set capital X, the equivalence class of an element little x in the set X is, we write it usually as X with a square bracket around it, subscript R, or if there's only one relation under this discussion, we can just write, drop the R. This is a set of all y in the set such that x is related to y mod r or the set of all y and x such that the pair x y is in r right these two notations are exactly the same by this but this is what is called the equivalence class so for example If X is the integers and R is the relation X, Y, such that X minus Y is an even integer, the equivalence class of zero, <coughs> this is all Y, in the integers such that zero y is in the relation, which means the set of all y such that minus y is even, which is just the set of all even numbers. 
So for the relation of x, y in the relation if x minus y is even, the equivalence class of zero is the even numbers. The equivalence class of one is all integers y such that one minus y is even and one minus y is even precisely when y is odd. This is the set of odd numbers. And the more time you spend thinking about this example, the better you will do in algebra. It's really very important. So let me just repeat that again. So we have this relation. All pairs x, y, and z cross z such that x minus y is an even integer. The equivalence class of zero is the even integers. The equivalence class of one is the odd integers, right? This is zero plus minus two plus minus four and so forth, plus minus one plus minus three plus minus five and so forth. What's the equivalence class of 15? That's all integers y such that 15 comma y is in the relation. That's all integers y such that 15 minus y is even. That's the set of all integers y such that 15 minus y is, let's say, 2k, an even number for some k. That's all y such that y can be written as 15 minus 2 times k. Now, 15, I will remind you, is 1 plus 14 or 1 plus 2 times 7. So this is a set of all y, so that's the y is equal to one plus two times seven minus two k for some k. Or the set of all y, so that's the y equals one plus two times seven minus k for some k. Well, this is one plus an even number. This is an odd integer. And every odd integer is of this form. So this is the set of all odd numbers. So the equivalence class of 15 is exactly the same as the equivalence class of one. In both cases, the equivalence class is the set of all odd integers. So there's a very important picture that underlies this. In general now for an arbitrary equivalence relation that R be an equivalence relation on a set X, so here we have the set X and for all X in X, we have the equivalence class, the subset, the equivalence class of X with respect to this relation. So for each X, you have the equivalence class of X. And 
The following is a very important theorem about equivalence relations. For all X and Y in the set capital X, we can take the equivalence class of X and the equivalence class of Y, and they're equal if X and Y are in the relation and they have no elements in common, they're disjoint. If X, Y, is not in the relation. Let's see. So how can we prove that? This is really um, this is this is algebra. This is proving properties of sets. So let's look at these things separately. Okay. Again, as I prove this, go through this, just ask me a question at any time if there's something, some step I need to explain further. So we want to show the equivalence class of X equals the equivalence class of Y if X and Y are in the relation. So suppose we let Z be in the equivalence class of X. What that means is that XZ is in the relation. But we also know, so this is the definition of equivalence class. That's the reason for this. X, Y is in R, that's given. So that means that Y, X is in R by symmetry. An equivalence relation is symmetric. So if X, Y is in R, Y, X is in R. So now we have Y, X is in R and X, Z is in R. And by transitivity, this means that YZ is in R by transitivity, which means Z is in the equivalence class of Y. So what I just proved that every element in the equivalence class of X is in the equivalence class of Y so the equivalence class of X is a subset of the equivalence class of Y. And I can repeat this argument interchanging X and Y which gives the equivalence class of Y is contained in the equivalence class of X. And the definition of equality of sets is two sets are equal if each is contained in the other. So the equivalence class of X equals the equivalence class of Y. So this proves that if X and Y are related, their equivalence classes are equal. But what happens if X and Y are not related? So suppose X, Y are not related, they're not in relation. I want to show, I want to prove the class of X and the class of Y have no element in common, they're disjoint. So we'll do this proof 
by contradiction, suppose the resistant element Z, which belongs to both congruence classes. So if Z is in the congruence in the equivalence class of X, that means that XZ is in the relation. If Z is in the equivalence class of Y, that means that YZ is in the relation. And of course, if YZ is, is in the relation, then ZY is in the relation. by symmetry. So if I take this statement and this statement, I have XZ in R and ZY in R. So XZ, XY is in R by transitivity. But X, Y is not an R, that's a contradiction. So therefore we're done. If X, Y is not an R, then the equivalence class of X is disjoint from the equivalence class of Y. Okay. And I would make one other observation by the reflexive property X comma X is always in X. So X is always in the equivalence class of X. Which means if we take the set S and we divide it up into equivalence classes, we get the whole set. We have one equivalence class, another equivalence class, another equivalence class, and so on. These equivalence classes have no elements in common and every element belongs to some equivalence class. So an equivalence class determines some partition of the set X. And if we look at the set of equivalence classes, we get something which is called the quotient of X, the set X, by the relation R is, we write it as X slash R. This is the set of equivalence classes. So for example, if we take X to be the integers and R to be our relation, all pairs such that X minus Y is even, there are only two equivalence classes. The set of even numbers is the equivalence class of zero. A set of odd numbers is the equivalence class of one. And we've divided all the integers up into the even and the odd. And the quotient of the integers by this relation is a set with just two elements, the equivalence class of zero and the equivalence class of one. And there is a function, the notation in the text is this, from a set X, you have a relation R, an equivalence relation to the quotient of X by R, 
which every element X gets sent to its equivalence class. So if you have Z and Z mod R, which consists of the equivalence class of zero and the equivalence class of one, the function from here to here, it would send, for example, 20, that's even, it goes to zero. Minus 86 also goes to zero, these are even. Three would get sent to one, the equivalence class of one. Well, April. Okay. Minus 29, it's an odd number, gets sent to the equivalence class of one. This is a function from the integers to this two element set, even and odd. And it sends an even number to even and it sends an odd number to odd. So I would say the textbook does what everything I did for the last hour in one paragraph. Um, and I'm just going through it in more detail, but there still is a great deal to think about here. Um, yeah. Here, let me do one more example of an equivalence relation which generalizes what I had given you a few minutes ago as a little problem to think about. And you take the set Z of positive integers, right? let M be a natural number, which just means a positive integer and we define the relation r sub m on z as follows x is related to y if m divides x minus y. Or another way to say that, this is the formula that you find in the book on page 10. R sub m, this relation, is the set of all pairs a, b in z cross z, such that a is b plus k m, for some k in z. Okay. This just means, this is just another way of saying m divides a minus b. So I claim this is an equivalence relation. Why is that? Well, A is equal to A plus K times zero. So A comma A is in this relation, sorry, is A is equal to A plus zero times M. So A comma A is an RM for all A. So this relation is reflexive and if A equals B plus K M, then B equals A minus K M, which is A plus minus K times M. So if A B is in the relation, then B A is in the relation. And finally, if A equals B plus K M, and B equals C plus LM, that says what? A equals B plus KM, but B is C plus LM plus KM, which is C plus L plus K times M. So if AB is in the relation and BC is in the relation, 
that implies AC is in the relation. So let me just repeat. Rm is the set of all pairs A, B in Z cross Z, where A can be written in the form B plus Km for some K. And this relation is called congruence mod M or congruence modulo M. This number M is called the modulus. Put the picture down a little bit, Professor. And if we look at the quotient, Z modulo this relation, this is the set of congruence classes of the integers modulo M. And turns out, they're exactly m minus one of them. The sorry, they're exactly m of them, zero up to m minus one. And why is that? Because for all integers a, if we divide a by the modulus m, what do we get? This is long division. A is some quotient Q times M plus the remainder. And the remainder is between zero and M minus one. This is just long division. So A is R plus a multiple of M. A R is in the relation or A is congruent to R modulo m, that's the way we write this. So we have just m congruence classes. Okay. Just from what long division, what you learned in elementary school, if you divide a by a number m, you get a remainder between zero and m minus one, and a is related to r. A, a is equal to r plus qm. So every integer is in one of these M congruence classes and no two of these are related. So there are exactly M congruence classes, modulo M. So the book writes, this is Z sub M. They just mean by that the quotient Z mod R sub M. And that consists of just these M minus one congruence classes mod M. Okay, well, what I've covered today in the book is the section on equivalence relations. Which is really just two pages in the book, nine to 11 or articles 17, 18, and 19. And it's worth spending a lot of time studying this and 
thinking about it and trying to understand it. But, but this is algebra. This is what we do in this course. We, we have this notion of a set, the notion of an equivalence relation, and they're very nice properties that they satisfy, and we try to understand them. Okay. Any questions about any of this? I do. Uh, I did post some office hours this week. Uh, there's one this afternoon at 1.30. There's one tomorrow at 1.30. And there is one on uh, Friday morning at 10.30. So I encourage you very strongly to think about what we're doing, study the book a lot. And, um, and it's a mathematics book. Like every sentence has a great deal of content and requires a lot of thought. So, and then just log on to one of my office hours and ask questions. And I'm happy to explain uh, as much as I can. Any more, any questions?